on today's show in 2023, the Padres were a disaster, but they did learn one thing. You give your young players a chance. What a concept. On today's episode, talking about Luis Campizano's 2023 season, all the good, all the bad going forward, and the birth of the hive. Let's get into it. You are locked on Padres. Your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Lockdown Padres Podcast, which is part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day for Thursday, November 9th. As always, I am your host with Sometimes Occasionally, but I promise you certainly not always the most Javier Reyes. Follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres for updates on the show account. And occasionally updates that I didn't really think all that much into, just tweeting out guaranteed contracts for for next season, and everyone freaking out and adding all this extra context. My apologies that I wasn't perfect on there. But anyways, guys, today's episode is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself. When you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics that treat 50 plus infections, get yours today at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. And today's episode, guys, it's the, the hive. It's the greatest moment for the hive that has happened in a long time. We are discussing Mr. Luis Campizano's 2023 season, partially because I've been, this is one of the most anticipated ones I've done in this player review series. I'm, I'm just gonna be, 100% 100% with all of y'all. You know what I mean? Like, I, I've been so excited for this one. And the reason is because I would argue it's one of the only things your boy was right about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's one of the only things that your boy was right about in this 2023 season, especially when you look at uh, before the season started, the very beginning of the season, everything. And it's, it's very exciting. It's very exciting to talk about him. And it's also because, quite frankly, I don't know why... They keep telling me that the announcement of a new manager is in a minute and it doesn't happen. So whatever, that, that'll that happen at some point later. But today we got to talk about that. And I think that Luis Campizano, and I mentioned this in the, in the opening teaser, I really do think that Campizano's tease, uh, season is a great example and further indictment um, of the Padres. And it is a great example of the Padres' ability these last few years, um, at least ever since I've been hosting this podcast, which is 2019, to really not show a lot of patience, um, particularly when it comes to their prospects, when it comes to their farm system. Now, some of that has been fine. You Darvish trade was pretty okay. Blake Snell trade was great. Joe Musgrove trade was great. Um, the Trent Grisham trade was okay, right? The Juan Soto trade was pretty big deal, right? Um, but they've shown in a, a remarkable impatience with uh, winning. And I think that while, don't get me wrong, I have preached many times on this podcast that it's a mistake to only highlight all the teams who struggle when they sign a free agent contract because um, you're kind of, um, what's it called? You're kind of endorsing the, the belief that that's how you win, is that you just do farm system stuff in perpetuity, right? When it doesn't. We've seen over and over, look at the Texas Rangers that literally just won the, uh, the World Series, right? And then you can look at all the Rays and the Brewers and the Guardians who get smoked every year. Baltimore Orioles a great example. You need to spend. Um, not necessarily as much as the Padres, but... One of the annoying things about the Padres has been like they have stars already on their team, but they continually keep trying to make trades and giving up on their talent and or rushing them in the first place. C.J. Abrams is one of the ones that comes to mind, right? Absent the guy that we're we're about to talk about for this episode. Abrams was brought up and it was like, okay, he's super talented. He's like 18 years old. I don't know how how old he is actually right now. He's like a baby practically in, in baseball terms, right? I don't even know if he was above the, the drinking age, practically, when he was being called up and getting so much hype as a prospect. And they call him up quickly in 2022, and they have this kind of platoon going with him and Hassan Kim, when my thing was like, the guy's young, you have him under control for a while, why are you why are you like speeding this? Because you already have Hassan Kim. Yes, Tatis is hurt, I could understand calling him up if Tatis was hurt and you didn't have Kim, but you had Kim, so it was like, how about you just give Kim a chance? You gave him inconsistent playing time his rookie year, that's why he was so poor, as we discussed on the Hassan Kim player review. And then you end up 
giving him more playing time, and look what happens. He succeeded. And Luis Campuzano is an example of that, but times 4,700. And the reason I say it's times 4,700 is because, and you cannot talk about Luis Campuzano without talking about this man who I'm not doing a season review for um, because it wasn't much to talk about, to be quite honest. Um, Austin Nola. Austin Nola, who I once called a Nepo baby, (laughs) I believe on Twitter. Just type in Nepo and you'll probably find it on my profile, my personal account. Um, And I said that because... And, and I wrote earlier for Just Baseball, and we're going to talk about that in a second, that I really couldn't stand that this really talented, top-level prospect who you have kept and you didn't make give away in the Soto trade or in general at last year's deadline, showing that there's still an interest in having him there, that you continually kept him out of lineups and benched him and sent him back down to the minors, and the guy that was taking his place wasn't Someone like, say, the way in the case of Hassan Kim or in the case of, oh, well, maybe you want to move Cronenworth there or whatever. It was Austin Nola blocking him, a catcher who, while this year was a disaster for him, isn't that bad, but still all not, not high enough of a quality to justify just not giving your prospect a chance, at least in my opinion, especially when you're trying to win games and you're a win-now team. I understand it if you're rebuilding. It's like, hey, let's just keep time. And unfortunately, the fact of the matter is that service time manipulation is a part of it. It's not what the Padres did here necessarily, but that that's part of it. But with the Padres, they're trying to win now and continually, and this was also the case in 2022, they kept giving Austin Nola at-bats and time at the position. And Luis Campuzano just never really got a chance, and that was what was so frustrating about him. And I mentioned this, that last year in 2021, or I'm sorry, Ew, I can't even speak. Um, in 2022, like Austin Nola wasn't horrible at the plate. Let me be very clear. He wasn't that bad. But, but he also wasn't all that interesting either. He had a 0.2 F4 in 2022 and with a 90 WRC plus. And, and on top of that, wasn't a very good defender necessarily either. So all of that culminated in why I remember writing my season preview for JustBaseball.com. Talking about all these things being like, He's the wild card factor. He is the X factor for this team heading into 2023. That was genuinely one of my beliefs. And again, it's one of the only things I was right about. And I think that what happened this year is you saw if you give players time, they can develop and they could get better. Because Campizano succeeded about as as much as I could have hoped for a young catcher, basically, in my opinion, kind of getting his first real licks at the major league level. Because back when, let's say 2020, when he first like got called up for a second... You had Austin Hedges. I don't think Austin Hedges is that good, but at least there's one thing he's amazing at, defense. He was a defensive specialist. You had Francisco Mejia, right? Like, at least there was at least, it made sense why you might be like, ah, well, you know, KP's has got to work on some things. Let's keep behind a catcher that pitchers are comfortable with, et cetera, et cetera. And they didn't do that for years until finally being one of the worst positional players in general in the sport finally made them change their hands. And they finally gave him a chance. And guess what? He excelled at the highest level this year. And he deserves all the credit for it. All the credit for it. And the Padres, this is a reminder of why I keep saying that. You already have some superstars. You don't have to just keep rushing everything. You Or or rather, yeah, on, uh, yeah, you don't have to keep rushing everything. They have good prospects and they have a good farm system for, or for a reason. So sometimes, every now and then, you don't have to just give up those players and give them for another superstar. You can just play them. And I think that's what happened in 2023. And we're going to talk about that season, guys. Because, man, was it a delight to talk about it and write about it and experience it this year in a year that gave us a whole lot of bad. Before we get into that, guys, let me just quickly mention to you, you can check out our friends over at Jace Medical. We spent a lot of time talking together, you and I, the listener, the viewer, perhaps, If you're watching on YouTube, remember to go subscribe on YouTube. We get fired up together on wins and losses, who starts and who sits. I'm thankful for that connection we have. And today, I want our chat to be a little more personal. I just learned that you can get a one-year supply. That's right, a one-year supply of ED medications. You realize what that means? Bring on extended travel. Next natural disaster that happens. Don't worry about supply chain issues. It's great. You are covered. You don't have to worry about whether or not you can refill your generics or whatever it's called. You know, your medicals, your supplies for, you know, Viagra, Rivago, whatever it is, whatever it is. And that's because it's possible because of our friends over at Jace Medical. Go online right now 
jacemedical.com to receive your 12-month supply on your daily medication. Remember to use the promo code Locked On also at discount. Hold on. Also at checkout for a discount as well. Glitched a little bit there, no problem. A verified customer also had this to say about Jace. I am thankful, in quotes, I am thankful for the service. Supply chain issues caused me to pull, caused me to cut pills and have to have it. I ordered most of my daily meds with a year supply. I also ordered an, an antibiotic kit. I feel secure now. Prices are lower than local pharmacies. I highly recommend this for everyone. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool. Provides five life-saving antibiotics. You can customize it. They're adding new ones. All you have to do is go to jacemedical.com and use the promo code Locked On for $20 off your purchase. You speak with their licensed medical professionals. They'll help you out, see what's right for you. And again, there's, they're evolving as time goes on. So if you need some medicals, if you need some help with your health and all that stuff, go check out jacemedical.com. And again, use Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Go check it out. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. We're talking Luis Campuzano, man. Of course, remember to go check us out on Sirius and follow me on Twitter and the YouTube and blah, 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 blah. But let's get into it, folks. We got to get into it. This is exciting. In 2023, Luis Campuzano's final slash line was very impressive, obviously. That's why I'm doing an episode on him today. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, he put up a 1.1 F4, which isn't incredible, but over across just 49 games, it is pretty dang good. So maybe if you parlay that into, let's say, maybe nine, 90 games, maybe that's a 2 F4 or something like that. But basically, 319, 356 on base percentage, 491 slugging, all good for a WRC plus of 1%. 30 friggin four obviously he sp sp uh, split a lot of time with gary sanchez who was also very effective for the team we'll be doing a player review on him next week but with campisano a 134 up wrc plus is absurd if you want to put that into context the average for the position is around like 90 90 or like 89 i believe was the was the average for major league baseball catchers this year like it was not exactly um what's the word like a position where you're supposed to get offense. It never has been. 89 WRC plus average this year, mostly strikeouts, and you're mostly used for defense. That's just what the reality of the position is. And if you want to compare him to some of the best catchers in the league when it comes to his bat, that 134 WRC plus, the best WRC plus among catchers this year was Adley Rutschman with a 127, followed by William Contreras with 124, Will Smith with a 119, Cal Rally with a 111, and JT Realmuto for 102. And that's it for catchers who played enough the minimum amount of games aside from Luis Campizano to have um, a WRC plus above 100. And he had a 134. Obviously, I'm not saying he's as good as those players. I'm just giving you context for how good his bat was, especially at the position. And honestly, even regardless of the position, he was an electric at bat. And I think that that's what's so fun about this guy is he, he just improved so much this year. Seven home runs and um, 49 games is excellent. You parlay that out for a more full sample size. Maybe he even hits 20 home runs. You know, like that's how good he was this year. And if you compare that to his previous stops in the major leagues, he had a 68 WRC plus in 2022 in 16 games where he hit 250 with a 260 on base, 333 slugging. And then in the year before in 2021, a negative 12 WRC plus in 11 games when he was really, really bad. And people were freaking out about how bad he was and he was a bust and whatever. Really rough stuff. He hit below 100, right? But of course, that wasn't the full friggin' story. And I really think that this is such a great example, man, of what happens when you give your players a shot. And as you all know, throughout the season, there was plenty of Campuzano hype. Let me tell you. If you're watching the video right now, I have screenshots of my tweets back from April. That's right, back from April. That's how long ago this was. It's crazy. Look, I can move it around and stuff. Ooh, I can move it around all over the place. Hold steady, campies on a hive. Our time will come. I tweeted that out back in April. I also tweeted it out from the at LO underscore Padres locked on to press Padres account saying, have no fear, can't be hive. Even our maestro manager can't hold off our power forever. And I said that back in April 12th when Austin Nola kept getting at bats over him. And then... Throughout the season, if you just type in Hive or Campuzano or Campy into either of my accounts, whether it be at Javapena or at Elon Padres, you will see a lot of uppercase freakout kind of 
tweets, Campy Zana Hive, this is our moment. I had all sorts that I was doing all year. And the reason is because, one, I'm barely right on anything, and this was one of the things I was right on. I just really did not understand why this guy wasn't getting a chance. And I wrote about over at Just Baseball. And this is, again, I already talked about this in the first segment, but I just want to give an example. And I wrote about this in an article titled, um, Do the Padres Hate Luis Campuzano? This is a real thing that I wrote. Um, And I actually remember at one point, I literally made like a Kirby thing of him cooking a stew and I photoshopped Campuzano onto it. And I kept saying to let him cook. And I meant that, seriously. I wasn't just saying that as part of a meme. Was the Hive sort of rhetoric part of the meme? Sure. But when it came to him, I actually stood by it. Reading from an article that I wrote, which is fun for once to say, um, regardless of the offense, I said, granted, we're talking about catchers. They're usually defensive specialists in that department. Nola has shown he's just as anemic of a player. In 2022, he finished with negative six defensive runs saved and rated in the 30th percentile for framing and the 19th percentile for pop time to second base. Not only have those percentile rankings been similarly bad in 2023, I wrote this article at the beginning of the season, but there haven't but there have been 17 stolen bases against him, the most against any individual catcher, and he's only thrown out one of them. So what in the flying jelly bean casserole is stopping the Padres from giving the kid, under whom, by the way, the team has yet to lose a game, a chance? Now, I said that at the beginning of the season, and I'm saying stuff that I said at the beginning of the season, not just to take a victory lap, although that is a huge portion of the equation that I enjoy doing, but to highlight that, that the fact that he was starting, there were so many games this year where I remember he would hit a double and draw a walk or something like that, and they would start Austin Nola the next day. And it's one of the only things, honestly, that I disliked about Melvin this year. I just didn't get it. I understand maybe 2022 where you're like, all right, he's an average, he's not that bad of an at-bat, especially compared to catchers. He could see a decent amount, amount of pitches. He can slap a single across the middle. I already mentioned his slash line. He's still, he wasn't that great, don't get me wrong, in 2022. 90 WRC plus isn't great, but it's okay for catchers. But my issue was that he had to be so dreadfully bad this season before they finally gave Campuzano consistent at bats. This guy in 52 games this year had a 38 WRC plus, 140, 260, 192 slash line, good for a negative F4. So how bad could Campuzano be? Oh, Javi, but Baseball America and um, I think it was Baseball America and Baseball Reference, they, they did their frame ratings and according to their frame ratings, Luis Campuzano was so bad that if they start him, they will for a fact, lose less games. Or I'm sorry, win less games. They will lose four more games. And I have a really big problem with this. I like analytics. They're helpful. I think that they're great when it comes to starting discussions about what is most valuable for a player. What is great for a player? What is uh, makes a player great? What players are better than others? It's information and it's useful data, right? Especially in baseball. But, but, The way analytics gets out of control sometimes is situations like this, where we're already, for a guy who hasn't had consistent at-bats, who hasn't had consistent playing time in general, all of a sudden, we're saying, after just a week or two, we know because of Baseball America's framing metrics that they will, capital W-I-L-L, will lose less games. Meanwhile, the guy that they were starting instead still had a negative F war, a negative one wins above replacement. So that was my big issue. Don't get me wrong. Luis Campuzano, he does struggle defensively. This is something I said despite being high on him for most of the time that I've been hosting this podcast and wanting him to get more chances. But my thing is, give him the chance. And it's not like Austin Nola was a defensive specialist, as I mentioned um, and tested to in that article that I wrote. That is my big problem. And I I could excuse maybe 2022 a little bit in the sense that in fairness, Campuzano didn't make the most of, remember, albeit very limited and sparse and sporadic opportunities. You could say, hey, we're really good this year. We're trying to make a playoff run. We want to close out the season strong. And the strength of our team is pitching. 2022, that was absolutely the case. Even after getting Juan Soto, Brandon Drury, and Josh Bell, frankly, at the trade deadline. Frankly, it was pitching. And you know what? I understand, you know, you got like a month of of games left. I understand if you're like, you know what? Let's kind of hang on to Nola because our pitchers, the strength of our team, that's what they feel confident in. They don't want to work with him now. We'll figure that out in the offseason. Even though Joe Musgrove is one of those people who was like, 
let's figure out how to work with this guy. You know what I mean? Shouts to Joe Musgrove, right? Like that guy was like, well, what are we doing here? Like this guy's good. Let's 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 give him a chance. We'll figure out how to work with him. That should be our job. And one of the other things that I brought up, and I believe I wrote this in my Just Baseball article as well, is that it reminds me very much um, of an article written back in, what was it? It was in the San Diego Tribune by Matt Calkins saying, but in retrospect, the Padres' reluctance to use Maz- Yasmani Grandal every day may have been like repeatedly taking the popcorn kernels out of the microwave just before they were going to pop. You know what happened? They refused to start Yasmani Grandal because pitchers didn't like pitching for him. And then what happened? They trade him. They lose him. He goes to the Dodgers instantly an all-star. I'm not saying that's what Luis Campuzano is, but it just shows you that the Padres have this weirdness. And I think that the whole idea of what pitchers are comfortable with is a little bit outdated sometimes. I understand it. I understand why they feel that way. But you can't let that dictate benching a player who has potential right? Who has promise, who has talent, who's young, who you have under control, right? It's like you you need some flexibility, especially on a roster with so much money in it, that you give him a chance. And that's where he succeeded. The guy was hitting the ball over the place. And granted, he didn't play enough games for some of his savant metrics to be set in stone, but his sort of expected batting average, he was up there. Sweet per- spot percentage, he was up there. Whiff and strikeout rates? <laughs> Also up there. That's right. The only thing that was wrong with him is sometimes he would chase pitches too much and and chase pitches a bit too much. His chase percentage and walk percentage weren't that great. In fact, his walk percentage was only uh, 4% this year. That's not very good. Strikeout rate was was fine. 12.1%. That's incredible, especially considering how much he was hitting the ball all over the place. But again, just based off that, you look at this and you're like, how the heck was Austin Nola starting above him? Not to mention when we learned that Austin Nola had had like an eyesight issue. So that explains why Austin Nola was so bad, but it's also hilarious to note that the Padres had someone who had eyesight problems taking at bats away from this guy. Very similar in, in a sense, in a sentiment to what happened with Anthony Rizzo of the Yankees, where they just realized like a month later, two months later, oh, wow, why did he go from being our best player to the worst batter in baseball? Should we maybe look at that one game where the one player on the Padres ran into him by accident and hit his head really hard and they had to take him out of the game? No, no, we're the New York Yankees. We're rich. Who cares? Um, Richest organization in the sport and they have no idea what's going on, right? Um, So again, a lot of ranting on today's podcast because again, I just give him a chance. And look what happened. He was one of the best offensive catchers in the sport. And along with Gary Sanchez, who again we'll talk about next week, created one of the more interesting tandems of catchers in the sport. A great combination, I would say. And that's what happens when you give the guy a chance. What a concept. What a concept. But of course, not everything was great. And we're going to talk about that in just a second, guys. But first, a few words from our sponsors. And I'm also going to drink some water, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen, here on the Lockdown Padres podcast. What a podcast it is. It is lovely. It is fantastic. And we are vibing, ladies and gentlemen. We are vibing. And one of the things I want to do to close out the podcast is honestly rant a little bit more and also just discuss again that Luis Campuzano was one of the great, um, like, nice saving graces of this season. I've already mentioned all of his stats. He's a really good hitter. Shocker, right? I am wondering what could happen to him going forward, though. And I'm not saying that he got lucky or anything like that. That's not what I'm implying, necessarily. But he did have a 331 Babbitt, which is a little bit high, especially for a catcher. Um, it's not like he's necessarily going to be a super speedster. This isn't, you know, um, who was a fast catcher? I'm trying to remember. Um, JT Robuto, I guess, is a pretty fast catcher. Um, Jorge Alfaro was actually pretty fast, too. But in general, yeah, a 334 Babbitt, does that suggest that his slash line is going to come down? Of course. Like a 319, 356, 491, obviously that's probably going to come back down. He would be in a Joe Maurer in his prime level catcher if he was able to do that for like a whole season, right? But even if he's like a 270, 340 guy, 270, 330 guy, 270, 320 guy, 260, 320, with the power and the ability to hit for extra bases, I think Luis Campuzano can absolutely do it next year. He was hitting the ball hard. He wasn't getting fluky luck or anything like that. 
And that's why I appreciate it. And it's not like the other guy who might be his competition, Austin Nola, hits for any power at all. And his weighted on base, expected batting average, exit velocity, barrel, hard hit, he is like the worst in the league. What he might be good at, assuming that this injury issue with his eyesight is amended and fixed in somewhat, is that absolutely, could he be like this backup catcher who at the very minimum could get you some slap singles, give have long at-bats? Like he has been good before in that sense where he's not going to hit for extra base power at all, which is why you should be starting Capizano more. But he also walks. He gets you a decent amount of walks and he's not going to swing at bad pitches. That's that's cool. That's very good, right? Like that's, that's very, very good. He's not going to chase. Um, so as a backup catcher, I don't hate the idea of Austin Nola. What I do hate is it feels like they kept him on the team partially because they refused to admit their mistakes uh, with the Ty France trade, uh, famously, right? So that's where we're at. But in terms of the future, Luis Campuzano does have some things to work on. And I hope that he doesn't have like a couple of bad games and then they decide to, for some reason, go back to Austin Nola, who, again, I called the Nepo baby. And the reason I called him that was because of his brother Aaron Nola. And I joked that they kept starting him because they want to recruit Aaron Nola. And then... Coincidentally, Aaron Nola has a pretty bad season for the Phillies, and now and then you know they're like, oh wait, maybe we don't want him. So yeah, yeah, give Campisano a chance. Like this guy doesn't have any bargaining power anymore. I'm of course, of course, I'm I'm joking. I'm joking. Where am I? <laughs> no, but seriously, um, Luis Campisano does have to work on his defense. Negative three defensive runs saved is not very good, and those Baseball America um, numbers that I was referencing, all that sort of discourse around how he's one of the worst framing catchers in baseball absolutely is worthy um, of being talked about, right? There were times this year when Campizano would drop the ball that was thrown at first base. He would try and throw out a runner at third, and the ball went sailing into the outfield. He does have some issues. I remember in a big game, I believe it was against the was it against the Giants, that he made some errors at home plate, and I tweeted, like, a tough blow for the Campy Hive or something like that. Like, he does have parts of his game to iron out. But it's almost like he's a young player and should be given the chance to. He's still just 25 years old. And I know that everyone's talking about Ethan Salas. Rightfully so. The kid's 17 and is freaking every single major league prospect evaluator out. But having Campizano until then could be huge for this team going forward. Having someone under control. Having someone who gives you some upside. Some flexibility with your lineup. Flexibility with how much you're going to spend. It's great. It is awesome. And I think that... um, well, again, he does have things to work about. I mentioned that. He has moments, and I already mentioned maybe he got a little bit lucky with this, some of the things with the slash line, but I just think if you give him more playing time, it'll be great. And most importantly, it's not like the guy that was starting ahead of him was all that effective of a catcher. That's my thing. Um, I'm not saying that if his um, eyesight sort of injury is fixed and or remedied, whatever, um, that Austin Nola can't be a capable player at all. But I'm just saying, even when his bat was okay, 0.2 F4. When Luis Campisano's defense wasn't very good, 1.1 F4. You know what I mean? Like, even when he... And also, that wasn't like a full season that Austin Nola did that, right? Like, that was in even more games. In 110 games, 0.2 F4. While Campisano had, like, basically 100 times that. No, that's not how that works. 100 times that? He had a full more one point <laughs> wins above replacement than him. And also played in, like, oh, like 70 less games, basically. He only played in 49. So yeah, of course the defense can be a problem. But if you're one, someone that believes in F4 like many others do, then his offense could potentially offset that. Again, if they had a stud at catcher, then yes, I understand wanting to figure out Luis Capizano's catching issues. He did have some moments that were really bad this year. And I remember actually in that article that I was citing that I wrote when he had an at-bat in which it was three straight strikes, he swung at all of them, it was rough, right? Like, He'll have some bad at-bats. And also, he does. He wasn't necessarily like the most clutch player in the world this year. You know what I mean? Now, granted, I think that this is something that you can't really... I don't want to fault him too much for because even the best players on this team were really bad in the clutch this year. Um, but he was, you know, not bad against either left-handers or right-handers. That was really good. Love to see that. In high-leverage situations, I actually was wrong with men in scoring position this year. He actually had a 134 WRC+. Plus. I was dead wrong. I thought that he wasn't very... Maybe it's Gary It's Gary that I'm thinking of. Gary Sanchez, who we're going to talk about next week. He wasn't very good in the clutch. But also, on top of all that, breaking news that I'm finding out as I record this podcast. With runners in scoring position, Luis Campisano this year hit 320 with a 340 on base and a 520 slugging. In high leverage situations, he hit 333 with 333 on base and a 5... 
133 slugging percentage. Of course, he refused to take any walks, but whatever. 138 WRC plus and 134 respectively in those situations. He was also good in there. Isn't that amazing? It was Gary that was bad there, which again, Campusano did everything you could ask for. Why did it take you so long? I don't understand it. I just, I don't understand it. I never will. Um, and I'm really curious to see what the Padres do if they do bring in another catcher, preferably someone who's a backup, preferably someone who is better than Austin Nola. So I just don't have to deal with watching that guy again because I just could not believe. And by the way, what if... What if at the beginning of the season, now don't get me wrong, because Campuzano did get hurt, and that's part of the reason why he wasn't able to play and given more playing time. I didn't like the whole Bob Melvin being like, we were just about to give him more time, because like, well, that's an awfully convenient thing to say. Maybe he's telling the truth, totally possible, but feels a little convenient. Um, so that's why, you know, he missed a bunch of time for the season, and that's why they had to keep starting Nola, don't get me wrong. But beginning of the season, the first like week or two, the first month or so, like, I was just watching this being like, why is this guy starting? Campisano, one for uh, two for four with a single and a double. Boom, Austin Nola the next day. What are we doing? And then, hilariously enough, Blake Snell still ended up pitching better. These pitchers we have were still very effective with Luis Campisano at the plate at the very minimum. He wasn't great with framing. He wasn't great with throwing out runners. I get that. He wasn't good in blocks above average, if you look at those stats, right? But... At least the pitchers were still good, and I was thinking in 2022 that that was the one reason to keep Nola is because of comfort and familiarity with the starting pitchers. And guess what? You had Gary and you had Luis Capizado, two guys who don't have a good reputation behind the plate as defensive catchers, and they thrived. So again, you have to be careful with that and the whole pitcher comfortability thing. It reminds me a little bit of the notion of, you know, you know the outdated, antiquated belief that if you participate in the home run derby, it's going to mess up your swing for the whole year, that type of thing. Like, it feels like an antiquated practice to have personal catchers for pitchers, like we used to have with Victor Caratini with Yu Darvish, something like that. So I'm hoping that next year, even if it is Nola as a second catcher, that they figure this out and they say, let's start Luis Capizado because this guy's better, he's got more upside, and frankly, um, Austin Nola isn't very good. So, again, all in all, I think Luis Campuzano's season is an A-. minus. I think that in 49 games, which granted is not the greatest sample size, but they never give him a sample size. So the fact that he was finally able to succeed, despite everything seemingly coalescing and conspiring against him to never play, despite being a top-level prospect, he finally made an impact. Is it possible that Campisano has some behind-the-scenes issues? Could be possible. He was arrested for marijuana possession a few years ago, and... Frankly, I do trust Bob Melvin as a clubhouse guy. So if anyone was going to bench him and or not use him as much as I, a schmuck in New Jersey talking into a camera, would have liked, Bob Melvin has a decent like level of credibility to be like, maybe he does know something. Personally, I have heard a couple things behind the scenes in terms of just like, is he the easiest to work with? Is he a personality problem? I've heard a couple things, but also, and I've said this before about Tatis, when it comes to personality and locker room stuff... Eh, a little hard for me to always get on with that, with with baseball. Long long story short, too long didn't read. I just don't trust this sport as much when it comes to locker room or personality issues because for them, you have Freddie Freeman complaining about Ronald Acuna Jr. and wearing eye black and having his hair a certain way and jewelry. So my thing is like that's the type of stuff that annoys people in baseball. So who knows if Luis Campisano, you know, to to quote the Jer Derek Jeter documentary that came out a few years ago where they talk about Chad Curtis, who couldn't stand that Derek Jeter was playing hip-hop in the locker room, right? Could you imagine getting reports that, like, Jeter causing problems in locker room, and it's because he was playing hip-hop? I'm just saying, it wouldn't surprise me, right? This sport is capable of not liking personalities or filtering out personalities, if you know what I mean, um, from players and it being framed as, like, them being locker room problems or being divas or whatever. Sport has a little bit of a culture problem with that. Um, so I don't always fully buy into that. But that being said, I have heard like a little bit. And that might explain it. And maybe he's grown up a little bit. He is 25 now. So maybe things have changed. Assuming he doesn't do anything dumb again and get arrested. That would be great. That would be absolutely great. So for next year, I'm really curious to see how this all pans out. I do not think that at all they should call e up Ethan Salas. Granted, AJ Preller is so impatient that it would shock me if he were to do so. But... They should be patient because Luis Campizano as like this bridge for a potential high upside guy like Salas is an incredible position to be in. And I'm, and by the way, that doesn't mean that I want either of them traded. 
even if Luis Campuzano, unless Luis Campuzano becomes Adley Rutschman, no. Like, you're just going to keep Ethan Salas and hope that Campuzano helps you for this period, and then Salas is the future, right? I would love that. I think that that's a great position to be in, and not many teams can say the same. It's one advantage that the Padres have for once. After being stuck with <laughs> the Francisco Mejia, Austin Hedges thing, and I guess one okay year from Derek Norris these past few years, that they finally have, like, a good catching situation, which is just mystifying. Mystifying that, we've, that we're even here. It's crazy how times change. Um, but guys... That's basically it. The guy hit well. He was one of the best offensive catchers in the sport, despite even in spite of the small sample size. He was extremely clutch. W what else do you want from the guy? The campy hive was vindicated, and it is one of the only things I was right about this year. Just incredible stuff from me. Incredible. Just, just puffing my chest out just a little bit. You know what I mean? Um... But guys, with that all being said, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast. The only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast from wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow me on Twitter at Javipeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or at L-O underscore Padres. In terms of the future of the show, tomorrow's episode, Talking with my buddy Aram Layton, longtime buddy Aram Layton, about the Padres farm system, the top 10 Padres prospects. We're going to be talking Salas. We'll flex a tiny bit more about our Luis Capizano love and then talk about guys like Merrill. Is he going to be ready for opening day? That'll be a big question. Next week, going to do a player review on Gary Sanchez. Continue the player reviews. And I feel like, I, no inside info, the new manager thing is probably going to come out soon. So when that happens, expect an episode to be covering that as well and may very well do a live episode um, if that happens. So look forward to that because live episodes, if you're subscribed, you guys can send me live questions in the moment. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah. So yeah. And then some things down the line, end of season superlatives, exposing old Padres takes that were bad, including from me, um, and Padres takes that were good, including from me. Um, so look forward to that, guys, despite all the weirdness in our world and in baseball and the fact that we are at that time period where John Heyman has to tweet things like, Cody Ballinger met with several teams. Wow. You know, despite the slow offseason and whatnot, we still got you covered here at Lockdown Padres. So until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My Friar Faithful homies, take care.